Hi, everybody. I'm Josh Corman from the International Spa Association, and we're thrilled today to be able to have a conversation uh, with a couple of medical professionals who might be able to shed a little bit of light on what is uh, a murky and, and difficult situation as spas around the, the country and around the world turn their attention toward reopening here in the coming days and, and weeks and months. Uh, so I'll, I'll let them introduce themselves and we'll, we'll pick up and go from there. All right. I'm Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm Nadir Bouyan. I'm a general internist in the Division of General Internal Medicine at Mayo Clinic. And my role during this pandemic has been co-director of the COVID frontline care team, which is our telehealth pandemic response. And I'm Brent Bauer. Many of you know me as the uh, medical advisor for iSPA. I'm also a general internist here in the same division with uh, Nadir. And I've also been the founder of our integrated medicine program and the medical director for our spa, Rejuvenate, here on campus. All right, well, again, thank you all so much for taking the time uh, to talk to us. Like I said, I know people have questions and there's so much uncertainty in, in, in different places. The context uh, of, of each spa's situation is, is gonna be a little bit different, but hopefully through, through talking through some of this, we can give people at least some sense of, of you know, what the, the most up-to-date thinking is uh, on what they should be doing, or at least uh, making every attempt to do as they turn their attention toward reopening. Um, and so we'll, we'll kind of start there. Obviously, spas are uh, not a low touch, uh, you know, business, right? Spas are places where people uh, are, you know, where physical touch is such a huge part of the experience, obviously, massage therapists, but really all across the board. Um, so knowing that, you know, knowing that this is a business predicated so much on physical touch, um, you know, what needs to be top of mind for spa owners and operators as they step back into, you know, the day to day of, of operating a spa, obviously, with restrictions uh, in place? So I think one of the most important things is you're going to need to have supplies, hand sanitizer, gloves, masks for guests and also employees. Um, and we need to know that we have enough of those supplies so that as people keep coming in when they're allowed to come back, that there's not a shortage. Um, the other thing I think is important is to have an action plan uh, from a management standpoint. So the staff know what to do and how it's going to work. Um, so, you know, one, one example of that would be, you know, eliminating the idea of a waiting room and having people wait in their cars. And when their appointment is up, you give them a phone call so that they can come in and maybe only that person at a time or a couple of people at a time so that it's, you know, safe. It's not a big crowd of people sitting in, in a common area. So having an action plan, you know, for that, but also for proper use of equipment that everyone should be masked, that everyone should wear glass, you know, gloves in between clients, changing the gloves, strict hand washing procedures, those kinds of things. Um, you know, if there is going to be an area where people have to wait in the line to check in or check out to make sure there's markings about where they should stand six feet apart and those kinds of things. And that way, if you have it as a written document, uh, all the employees can be on the same page and everyone you know, knows how to go about doing this in the right way. And I think it, it, it's, what's also important is making sure that anybody that has any symptoms doesn't actually come into your place of business. So screening for those symptoms prior to those clients coming into the spa uh, would be an important step before they're allowed in the building. And what about uh, when it comes to massage therapists, for example, specifically, you know, if you're at a front desk, you can put up maybe a plexiglass shield, you can have touchless payment options. There are ways, like you said, to, to practice social distancing. Uh, but for somebody who, you know, is going to be in a situation where physical touch is going to be a part of their experience, you know, what steps beyond, I think, you know, or maybe not beyond what steps within that range of things that, that people are, are being told to practice by the CDC and other sources, um, you know, is, is really important for those individuals, both the guest and, and the, the staff member as they, you know, interact with each other in close proximity. All right. So I think it's an important question, you know, as, as physicians, we're seeing patients back as well. So we're, we have to examine them and put our hands on them and listen to them with devices. So kind of the same principles that, you know, both parties should be masked when, you know, doing something like a massage. Uh, I think it's important that that individual is gloved, right? And I think before that client comes in, the hand, there's a strict hand washing uh, protocol in place before they come in, but also after they come in. And, you know, this idea of an N95 mask, I think for something like massage, not necessary. 
Uh, it's more important for people that are doing procedures that are going to generate aerosol. So a dentist would need an N95 mask or somebody doing a procedure in a hospital. But I think if both parties are wearing, you know, masks, surgical masks or cloth masks and gloves, that should suffice. Um, if you're going to be manipulating the face at all, if it's available, having goggles or a face shield, I think would be beneficial for the person that's doing the treatment. Um, but certainly not necessary. But, you know, there's always a chance somebody might sneeze uh, while wearing a mask, and it would be nice to have a face shield if you're working directly on their face. Right. Well, and, and one of the other protocols that people are looking at putting in place to kind of, you know, keep up those, those safety measures as they walk in, uh, you know, to a spa includes things like taking the, the temperatures of, of staff, especially, um, and, you know, making sure that no one comes to work sick, no one comes into the spa if, if they're, they're ill. And we know, you know, there've been all sorts of questions about asymptomatic, uh, you know, people and, and people who, who show symptoms. How big a step is uh, the temperature taking? What, you know, what sort of level of, of, I guess, protection does that provide, knowing that when you walk in the door, at the very least, you don't have that sort of top line symptom? So yeah, you know, I think for employees, having them check their temperature at home before they come to work is important. You know, and you're not going to be able to find the asymptomatic people unless everybody gets tested, right? And that's not possible right now. But if everybody's masked and everybody's following proper distancing protocols and hand hygiene, you know, then I think it, you will be, you'll be able to reduce transmission quite a bit. Um, and it's the ones that are symptomatic are the ones that have a higher probability of spreading it. So by checking a fever, which if you look at the studies, you know, somewhere between 70 to 90% of people that are going to have symptoms have fever is an important step for employees. And if you have the capability to check temperatures on clients before they come into the office, you know, that's an added benefit as well. But I think even if you have a client that comes in who's infected, but they don't have any symptoms or an employee, as long as they're masked, they have gloves, their hand sanitizer is available and there's strict guidelines, uh, you know, on hygiene before and after clients, you know, that's a pretty strong way to reduce transmission. Um, you mentioned testing and I know that testing has been something that, you know, it has been a subject of conversation across the, you know, across the globe, governors are, are asking for more capacity. Uh, and that's been a real challenge for, uh, for countries around the, the world. I mean, here in the U.S., obviously, but everywhere about building testing capacity to a point where you can, you know, really start to, to step forward with maybe a little more confidence uh, when it comes to reopening businesses. Um, what are the challenges that we're facing? How big a deal right now or, or how big a deal would it be if we could kind of have the testing capacity um, to, to go a little bit further even than just temperature checks, but being able to know uh, when, when people come in where they stand a little bit more firmly. Right, so if you're ever to do widespread testing and contact tracing for close contacts, it allows you to reach out to those individuals and let them know that you need to remain isolated uh, in your house for 14 days. And I think that if you're able to do that, you're reducing people going out in the community and reducing transmission. So you know, people can feel more comfortable opening up businesses knowing that there's widespread testing going on and positive individuals are being identified and the people that they've come in contact with are also being identified. So that, that definitely helps from that standpoint. But I think, you know, before we reach, you know, that area, if you assume that every person coming into that door, you know, could have the virus and transmit it, if you operate from a safety, uh, you know, standpoint as that, you'll be able to reduce your, your infection and transmission rate. So, you know, that's the idea of having those written protocols for staff and patients on how, you know, the visits are going to go. So, the, so they know that both parties know that this is all being done to reduce transmission. Uh, if you behave with each individual as that they may transmit it, so they're masked, you're masked, you have gloves, there's hand sanitizer, you know, regardless of who might be positive, who might not be positive, that eliminates any, you know, break in protocol. You just assume everyone can give it to you. And if you operate in that standpoint, regardless of how much testing is going on, you know, that's probably one way to start ramping up your business. Uh, and, and Dr. Bauer, for spas specifically, 
when it comes to some of the spaces, we've heard a lot of people talk about their wet areas, you know, their steam rooms and their saunas, their locker rooms, their communal areas, any, any place where there's, there were the shared amenities or where people are going to have a difficult time not coming into close contact about just not opening those, you know, doing kind of a partial reopen, closing those spaces off or being really uh, intent about the way that they handle, um, you know, people's, people in their, the physical space of their facilities. Um, you know, that seems like a, 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 a wise step, you know, a, a sort of, you know, uh, discretion is the better part of, of valor in there. Um, so, you know, for spas specifically where they have these spaces where people are, are interacting so, you know, so frequently, does that just to you make the most sense to just sort of, if you can't be pretty sure that you're not going to have to police people coming into contact to just leave those areas uh, alone as much as possible? Yeah, you know, I think safety first is going to be the best approach. There's just so many unknowns right now. So I do think there's some wisdom there. I think you're going to see some help coming at the state level. So certain states have already released very specific guidelines on how to reopen, what's allowed, how much distancing, uh, what disinfectants to use. So I think, you know, A, what is your current state regulations about those spaces? Uh, and if you don't have it for your state yet, several states have posted theirs. Arkansas has got a nice set of uh, mm -hmm. guidelines and what they're doing to allow spas uh, to reopen. So I think that's one resource. Uh, obviously, uh, iSpa has a nice reopening uh, your spa area uh, guidance, which I think is very good, good place to start. And then the CDC has a nice site on the different disinfectants, which ones actually work on this virus. So I think you, you can arm yourself with those things. You know, then it's going to come down to a personal decision. How well can you monitor that space, monitor the people coming in, the employees, how clean can you get it between uh, visits and so forth. And then you're going to make a personal decision at some point based on that information. But it, it's too early to make a broad blanket. You should or shouldn't. But until we know more, I'm personally going to err on the side of caution. Yeah. And we've heard from a lot of people, you know, the, the, the top line items, those increased sanitation, um, you know, standards and making sure that you're following what the CDC and, and those organizations are saying about making sure that that's done well, training staff, making sure that your staff, the best cleaning protocols in the world don't make a difference if, uh, you know, the people who are implementing them uh, aren't trained on how to do that well. Uh, and obviously that's, that's going to be a big, you know, a big factor, I think, in the, the confidence probably of, of spa goers, you know, returning is seeing that stuff and being confident that, that uh, spas are taking those measures. Now, what about from that side of it? So, you know, what is it that spa directors and spa owners can be telling their guests who are probably really eager in many cases to come back to, you know, to start picking up kind of their treatments and, and you know, getting the, the spa experience back into their life if they miss it. Um, what can they be telling those individuals? You know, they're not staff, they're not employees, they can't govern them in that way. But what messaging should they really be sending to people before they come to the spa uh, to make sure that they're able to kind of do their part? Yeah, I, you know, I think there's going to be a new social contract. And, and that social contract is going to be, I may have a spa, I've got a lot of responsibilities to you, my, my client, but you as a client are going to have to take on a different role in this new era. You know, if you're sick, you're going to stay home. If you think you're sick, you're going to stay home. Uh, you know, we're going to take care of each other in a much higher level than what I think the, the, the old contract was. I'm, I'm a customer. Whatever I want is right. And that can't be true in this new age. So in this new era, we have to have a different social contract where you and I have to each lead equally come to this and say, yes, I have a responsibility, you have a responsibility. And then I think, you know, we get back to the whole point of why were they coming to the spa in the first place? Mm -hmm. If part of coming to a spa was how you reduce stress, and we know that stress suppresses immune function, you know, it sort of becomes, well, there's a little push me, pull you, you know, we, we don't want to go in there when it's not safe from an infection standpoint, but if you've taken away my main approach to reducing stress, maybe we're actually hurting us from an immune standpoint. So there's a balancing act in all of this between, you know, well, let's not even go to the spa for 12 years until right. we're sure the virus is gone. <laughs> maybe that's not the right approach. So how do we find that middle ground? And I think that's what people are starting to come to. Yeah, and I think Dr. that, uh, that uh, middle ground that Dr. Bauer was talking about, you know, I think to the extent that is appropriate to share your protocols with your clients of what you're doing to protect them, but also to protect your staff so that the business can continue, but you're not putting them at any increased risk to let them know that you're actually interested in their safety as well as your own. And I think it would be 
comforting to both the staff, but also the patients that everybody knows what this institution is doing for each other's safety. And everyone, I think, from that standpoint, when the businesses start opening up, will feel more comfortable, including, you know, staff and clients, you know, and I think, you know, one strategy is to do a trial period, maybe for a week, where you bring in maybe just a few clients, just to show your staff know what to do, you know, is there anything that's unpredictable that could happen that you didn't plan for? And make sure everybody's comfortable with the process. Does it need to be refined? Where did we drop the ball if we drop the ball? And then now that you have a trial period, you can say, all right, now we're more comfortable. We figured out some loopholes. Let's bring more people back because we address the concerns. And I think that's a proper way to go about it, even though I know that everybody's hurting financially. Yeah, I, th I think that what you said is something that reflects what we've been hearing from, from members uh, that you know, it is going to be that push and pull a little bit where, you know, people do want to come back. That's on the staff side. That's on the, the spa goer side. They want to, to come back into those spaces. They want to maybe return to work um, or maybe they're hesitant about it. And it's a balancing act between, you know, both of those desires, the desire to be safe. Uh, and, and obviously everybody wants to feel when they walk in the door, like what they're seeing, what they're hearing from, from the spa is, you know, is reassuring them, is giving them that confidence to be able to, to be there. Uh, as Dr. Bauer said, you know, without, to go to a spa and have your stress levels rise because you're worried about the way things are set up is not, uh, not what anybody wants as far as, uh, as far as outcomes. Um, well, you mentioned the, you know, the idea that, that people are going to be coming in, they're going to be having this uncertainty. They're going to have these questions, but then as they sort of, you know, sort of get into the experience and it becomes normal again, spas may find that they didn't realize, they didn't know what they didn't know, you know, before they reopened, where are they going to find those and getting people in on a trial basis, you know, that makes a lot of sense because it gives, like you said, the, the staff an opportunity to kind of train and practice their training, but also to, to react to those. So I'm going to ask you a question you may not be able to answer. What, predicting what you can't predict, you know, if, if you, you know, looking at it from a medical perspective, you know, what are the things that might be likely that people overlook as part of as part of reopening that they may not think about as being um, you know important or critical or just they don't come to mind as being those things that need to be in place before people return that um, you know that they might be able to to plan for a little bit if if they they get some insight into that because once it's once something's gone wrong it's a little bit too late on that you know in that sense what what might there be. Uh, that that you know you you would say as a as a medical professional you know maybe you're not thinking about this but you should be. Yeah, it's not an easy question to answer. But one of the, one of the first things that that come to mind is, you know, it's easy to conceptualize the, the client encounter. They're coming in for let's say a massage, and there's a massage bed. So and then there's a massage therapist, right? So the massage therapist is masked. The client is masked. The massage therapist is wearing gloves. They properly sanitize their hands before and after the massage and the patient left, but did the patient wear gloves? Did they touch door handles? Who touched the door handles? Are the door handles being sanitized? Is the massage bed being wiped down with disinfectant? You know, there's areas that humans are gonna touch, right? Desks, pens, these kinds of things. Should we have pens that they should just take with them so we don't have them put them back, right? So those are some things that you don't consider how many things that we touch. Credit cards, should we go completely dig digital, right? Should we have them pay up front or maybe pay after digitally? No cash, maybe no credit card even. So these are some things to think about. You know, there's a lot of applications out there um, that allow you to do digital payments. So maybe if you didn't have the capabilities before, getting those capabilities now or at least start that process so that people can pay without exchange of plastic or paper, which is another way to transmit germs. So that's those are some things that we don't think about. It's easy to conceptualize the experience, but uh, the door handles and the other things people may touch is an, is an area where you can plan for. And if you have the necessary equipment, you can do that extra level. And then you can let your clients know that this is the level that we're going to for your safety and our safety. So you can feel comfortable coming back. Dr. Bauer, do you care to predict the unpredictable? <laughs> well, no, I, <laughs> Anything I, additional? No, Nader hit a couple of key points. And I think, you know, it's interesting now as you come into Mayo Clinic, you park your car, you walk through this door, you come to this building, you, you know, how many points do we have automatic doors? How many points do we have uh, something I can bump with my elbow and open the door? And then when you hit a door that you still have to manually grab, you know, it mm -hmm. becomes very striking. So, you know, that's not something I would have thought about, but if I have the opportunity 
to reduce those touch points. It's one less thing I have to worry about sanitizing it. So, I mean, is that something we should be thinking about as we go through this? Uh, you know, how does the massage therapist get the extra oil they need in the midst of a massage? You know, are they touching the pump after touching the person? So, I mean, I think if you kind of follow Nader's point and just kind of maybe bring a, uh, an employee as a quote participant and have them walk through that whole process in your environment, how many different places does that have a contact that we now have to sanitize? Can we eliminate those touch points? And if we can, how do we sanitize? And I think that starts to go to that point of, you know, I'll do the best I can in my store or my shop to protect you. You come in and do the best you can to protect me. If we do it together. I think we can get back to pretty close to normal. Yeah, for, for sports fans, it may be akin to uh, practicing before you play the game. You know, there's a reason why, why you know, highly trained, highly skilled people still practice because, you know, there are always those things that can, uh, you know, that can go, you know, go sideways a little bit. Um, well, we, one, one thing we've been hearing a, a ton from, we know that, that you know, everybody who's, who's in the spa industry uh, that we've talked to has really stressed a lot of what you guys are saying. I, I know that, that people want to get back, but they want to do so safely. They want, they don't, you know, nobody is looking to do this uh, irresponsibly. And so uh, it's, it's great to, to have, you know, some of hopefully what they're already thinking and planning for reaffirmed and, and maybe give them some, some ideas uh, additionally to make sure that they're, you know, dotting I's and, and crossing T's because as we, we said, it's a complex process. There, there are no easy answers here and there's a lot that we don't know, but uh, hopefully taking, you know, taking these steps and being mindful about them can help pave the way for, uh, for reopening to, to happen responsibly. So uh, thanks again so much to, to Dr. Bauer, Dr. Buyan. Uh, we appreciate it uh, greatly. And uh, our, our members, I'm sure, will be thrilled to, uh, to hear from you. For more COVID-19 resources, including our reopening toolkit that, uh, that Dr. Bauer mentioned, you can go to experienceispa.com and check that out. Uh, and, you know, we, we hope as time goes on here to be able to, to continue talking to people who can provide us with, uh, with insight like uh, you all did today. Again, really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Uh, on behalf of ISPA and our members, we we uh, glad to hear from you. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for the opportunity. Yes, thank you all.